Today I want to talk to you a little bit. God kind of gave me a change in my direction. I had a message that I have been sharing, just tweaking off this past year. And so I was happy to work on that. But then he said yesterday, I want you to share something else. We're going to be talking today about resting faith. Resting faith. And our scripture is found in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. <laughs> Verses 1 through 13. Everybody have it? Take your time. We want to make sure that we have time to get it because this is a topic. I actually have a prayer journal that I have been working on since the beginning of January of 2022. And the journal is rest. Rest. So every scripture every day has to do with that. So I know that was for me. So I've been working on it for almost a year. But yesterday the Lord said for living word, healing and restoration, coming up upon your 40th year in ministry, resting faith, Hebrews 4, 1. And I'm going to read it from the NIV. makes it a little bit easier to understand. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You know, the King James says, to him with whom we have to do. <laughs> there is a rest for the people of God. You can be seated. Praise God. Wanted to read it, it's long, it's a long passage, 
but it's a powerful passage. So today we want to talk about resting faith. And I'm not going to be long because I know this is a familiar passage. A lot of us have heard it over the years, probably wonder what does it really, really mean. It has a lot of meat in it. And so today we're just going to focus on two of those verses that we read. Wanted you to get the overall context for somewhere. He has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And that somewhere is the scripture. In Psalms 95, he talked about this. And so this is a quote of that. It's really important for us to recognize, just to bring us up to where we are, because I think it's really important. The preceding chapter in the larger context of this scripture talked about a whole generation in Israel that did not enter into the rest of God. They did not enter into the promised land. There were a lot of reasons why they didn't, but the bottom line was most of the people that started out with the promise didn't get to inherit it. And so they are an example to us of what not to do. You know, in the day and age that we live in, we get our faith tested. I was so glad to listen to the testimonies this morning because we overcome. You may not know how important your testimony is, but every word today was powerful to me because it showed how God was at work in three different instances, doing his job the only way that he knows how to do it, which is breaking us down and allowing us to see how much he loves us, how much he has for us, how it is that we are more important many times than we even know that we are. Thinking about something funny, you're tickling your funny bone this morning. We were coming up from Durham yesterday, and so we were driving along. We had, we have this new space age car. We have a Tesla, so it's kind of interesting trying to get used to it. So we had 273 miles. We knew we could get here because this was only 188, right? So all was going well until we got to South Hill, and I looked down and I saw, well, gosh, we've only in regular miles, it's only 73 miles from home, but we've used 100 and some. And I'm beginning to think, oh, my goodness. So we start going across. I decide, well, you know, we've got enough. We can, we can get there, I'm sure. Instead of following God's leading, <laughs> disobedient, I didn't stop in South Hill and, and go to the Tesla place where you're supposed to, you know, be able to charge up in 15 minutes and bring it back up. Well, all the while that you're driving in this thing, it has this huge screen like a computer you're sitting at, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of distracting. You can see all the cars behind you on it. You can see the cars to the right, to the left, everything that you're going to come up against. It'll even give you a warning like it kind of went a blip noise as we were going along. I'm like, gosh, it's letting us know every little thing. It reminded me, put me in mind of what the Holy Spirit does for us, right? But this is just man's technology built on God's wisdom, of course. So we're going along and I get to Emporia and I decide, oh, well, you know, I, it wasn't that I didn't have faith, right? But I wasn't resting in it, to be honest. So I pull over to Walmart to see if I can charge up there. Not the right kind. I didn't have the right stuff, right? <laughs> so that lets you know, you know, you can kind of go along your way and have your own thing in mind, your own plan in mind. But if you get to a certain place and you can't charge up with the right thing, then the Holy Spirit is saying, wait a minute, back up, keep going on in your faith, right? So there are all these distractions on the road all these distractions in life. And that's what was happening to these people in the scripture. 
So we get on down and we get past Emporia and I, I get to sing it. <laughs> We've come this far by faith, right? <laughs> Woodson song. It was, it's one of those old, old songs. If you're under 20 or under 30, you probably have never heard it, but it's, we've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He never failed me yet. And then we get to that, oh, you know. And I'm just a singing and carrying on, so we get up here to, uh, we pass Suffolk. And then all of a sudden, this big red thing comes on, and it, it lets me know, mm, battery's going down. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Well, I've got 50, it says 52 more miles in their frame of reference. It's only 19 miles, right, from Suffolk to, to Portsmouth. So I know I can make it. It goes down and down and down. And I get back, and I'm trusting, and I'm having faith, and then I go back to singing. Well, I look over at my niece, Ashley who has been with me for a couple of years. And so she said, well, you know what? I had confidence. I said, come on now. <laughs> I'm coming by faith, and I'm singing to build mine, right? It's supposed to be resting in it. She showed me the principle. you got to have confidence. She believed it. She didn't know about all the other stuff that was going on. She just had confidence. And that's what we need in order to rest in God. You know, resting, when we talk about that Sabbath rest, remember many years ago, we used to have what we call blue light. On Sunday, nothing was open, very few things. Maybe a restaurant here or there, a 7-Eleven, a grocery store. If they were open, they had shortened hours, right? Well, now we're in this age, some of you have never experienced that. All you know is 24-7, 365, everything is open, right? But during those times, what it forced us to do, and our forebears before them, was to come to church. You know, church was central. So it didn't matter anything about who knew who or whatever your faith connection was. Church was church. You found yourself in the house of the Lord, right? And you, after that, you know, usually they had cooked dinner on Saturday. <laughs> and then you'd have these big Sunday gatherings where everybody would come. And then after that, you know, it would be chill. Everybody would just, you know, kind of take a break. There wasn't a lot with um, watching television. It was a time of connecting. But the most important connecting was you spent that time before the face of God, before the very face of God. And a lot of things could get worked out in that Sabbath rest, right? Well, what happens now in today's time? We see that the children of Israel... Did, they missed it totally. They did not enter into the promised land that was prepared for them because of disobedience. And what was the key thing? It was their lack of faith. When Moses sent the group into the promised land to spy it out, just to see what God had provided for his people, he only had two people that came back with a positive report. All the other ones complained about how big the people were, how big the fruit was. It was flowing with milk and honey. I mean, that was great, but to some people, that was a challenge. They were afraid of their shadow. And so they saw themselves as grasshoppers and the people as giants because of a lack of faith. Today, many of us, will not enter into what God has promised us because of a lack of faith. And how is it that we know we have this faith? Hebrews, the 11th chapter, gives us a great outline of what faith is. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, 
In the kingdom of God, faith is one of the most important principles because without faith, we can't even believe that Jesus Christ came for our sins. And that is the number one thing that we have to believe. We have to know that we know that we know that we are so important and so valuable to God that he sent the most precious that he had, his only begotten son, his only one, to come into the world and to save us from our sin. Total, complete salvation. That means that everything that we need from that point on is covered under the saving power of Jesus Christ. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. You cannot do it. You have to have it. And we have to have faith to live. Faith is like money in the kingdom. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. Faith is how it is that we live, how it is that we receive healing, health, wealth, everything that we need. If we have a problem, it comes as a result of our faith. If we can exercise our faith, we can do anything. And the reason that this is so important is that God has given each and every one of us in here a job to do. The reason that we are all here today is because of the vision of living word healing and restoration. Our church is abundant life assembly, right? So our anchor scripture is John 10.10. 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So I, too, have been working on this series about abundant life, the, the great, you know, the great messages around that. But the Lord was reminding me that you cannot have life until you have faith. You have to accept Jesus first, right? And then you begin to have life. That is the first principle. So this living faith, this resting faith that God is sharing with us today is so important. It is integral to our very existence. And to rest is not just to have Sabbath on Sunday, but it's to live a life of rest, right? So we don't want to forfeit our spiritual inheritance. You know, there's an inheritance that we have. We are God's children. And so as a result of our saving faith, we enter into this life that he has for us, this abundant life. Well, as a result of that, it's just as though when he, Jesus passed on, he rose again, and then he gave to us an inheritance. He gave us the New Testament that showed us how to live. So everything that we need can be found in the word of God. But we have to take it up every day. We have to look to the word of God so that we can claim that inheritance. It's just like reading a will. Every time you sit down with the word of God, you're reading Jesus' will. And his will for us is to have life. And in order to enter into that, that promise, we have to rest. Now, in verse 4, it talked about God's rest, right? The rest that Jesus, that God had as a result of creation, right? He, he flung the, world's, the world into place, all the galaxies, all the things we study about in school. He flung that. Scientists know it's there. They can see it. They don't know how it got there, but they know it's there. We know that we are in existence because of his will. The one thing that no one can do but God is give life. It doesn't matter what kind of circumstances it comes from. He's the only one that can give life. So God rested after he did all of his work. He made man and woman. 
He created our world for us to live on, to inhabit, and then he rested. So that's the example of what he wants for us. That's why in verse 9 it goes on to say, there is a rest for the people of God. There is a release that we have to come into. Many times we live beneath our privilege because we are not resting. We have to have that confidence of knowing that everything that we need, God can provide. No more toil. You know how sometimes, how many of you have been really, really tired? Really tired. It just seems like one thing after another after another. And it just drains your spirit. So God doesn't want us to live like that. He wants us to recognize that he loved us so much that he sent Jesus. And as a result of that, he has provision for us. It's those resources that we don't know where they come from. That's part of it. He doesn't want us to live fatigued. You know, sometimes we just kind of give and give and give and give until we give out. He doesn't want us to live like that. He doesn't want us to have our bodies where we're sinking under continued toil. He wants us to enter in to that rest. No more exhaustion. You know, sometimes you can work till you're exhausted. And you don't feel, sometimes you don't even feel right unless you've worked until you're exhausted. We have to change our mindset. A lot of it is trans, being transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? So that every time he gives us a word, a message, then that means he wants us to live, to walk under that. He wants to give us the good word, the benediction, the good word, to go out and live under that. I was actually working with some, some folks, and I was just, you know, I was just, I just watched the situation, and I thought, don't they know that you really, really don't have to do this this way? You know, a lot of times we do things the same way that we have done them, year after year after year after year just because we've done them that way. You know, a lot of you I know have heard that story about the lady that was cooking in the kitchen with her mother, right? And so how she would cut the ham a certain way. And they were wondering, <laughs> her daughter was like, well, Mom, why are you doing it? Grandma does it that way. And the grandmother was saying, well, actually, it was my mother that started it because we had a certain kind of pan, <laughs> and we always had to cut the ham a certain way for it to fit in the pan. Well, look at all the generations later. They were still following that same principle, cutting the ham off, and they had, they had a big enough pan, right? So God is saying today, there's more than enough. There's a big enough pan you don't have to continue to do the things that you do, the way that you do them. There's a new way. There's a new way. And keeping that Sabbath rest, you know, not only is it releasing the old, the toil, the fatigue, the old way, but it's also a sacred repose. Now, if you look in scripture, when Jesus prayed, he pulled aside. And regardless of what was going on around him, he was in a certain state. And so that's the way we have to live as believers. We have to be able to pull aside. And a lot of times, the more that we get into that position, you know, that prayer position or whatever that position is that we have where we... we calm ourselves and we say mm -mm, no more of this you calm yourself and you get in that sacred repose everything will try to hit you to pull you out of that rest that state it doesn't matter a lot of times what we go through we continue to go through it because we don't learn the lesson we have to learn 
to rest. So I know it's a tough thing. We are accustomed, especially in our country, to always being on the move, to move from one thing to the next to the next, whether it's our programs, whether it's at school, they keep you going. They have so many activities during the week, so many things that you have to do. But we have to move into a position where we can stay in that sacred repose, where we can say no and feel fine about it. You know, if something comes up and somebody has something for you to do, feel comfortable saying, mm -mm, no, I, I really can't do that right now. And then sometimes they'll push you and say, well, what else are you doing? Feel comfortable saying, I've got something really important I've got to do. And give yourself that time. All of that rushing about is not necessary. You can make this, take the same time and put stuff in order so that you can stay in that repose. It sounds really simple, but even Jesus had to admonish the disciples, right? He had to let them know, well, they're clamoring, people are clamoring to eat. You know, eating is really important. And they're clamoring to eat, and there are all these people out here, what are we going to do? We can't go into a grocery store and get food. It's not going to matter anything anyway what you do, because the resources have to be supernatural. So until Jesus took the little boys, five fish and two loaves, and broke them, there wasn't enough anyway, right? So it was no need to be worried. It was no need to be stressed. The provision came when it was needed. The provision came when it was needed. A lot of times we worry, getting out ahead of it, what are we going to do? when all we have to do is rest. Have that confidence. Because there's nothing you can do about it anyway, right? When you need to be healed, there's nothing you can do about it anyway except to stand fast in faith. When I was 18 years old, I had grown up with a heart murmur. So my mother said, well, you're going to have to go to school because you're not going to be able to do any hard work. <laughs> So when I was 18 years old, I had gotten baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. I grew up in the United Methodist Church, but my grandfather was a Pentecostal district elder. And so when I saw the words of the Bible, by your stripes, by his stripes, I am healed. When I saw that, I thought, goodness nobody ever told me that <laughs> but it was like I was not doing anything it really important I was just reading the scripture in, after school one day on campus and it came up off the page into me and I was healed of that heart condition I was born with the doctor said that I had a you know like your valves on your heart bicuspid tricuspid Mine was faulty, and it on my aorta, it was not even properly formed. So I was not even supposed to live that long, but God healed me. I wasn't doing anything in particular except reading the word. So the most important thing that we can do is to eat this word and allow the Holy Spirit to put us in a position where we go, uh-oh, wait a minute. A light bulb has to go off to say, I don't have to live like this. I used to have to have people carry my things. I couldn't go up so many stairs. Um, it was awful. I had to take penicillin, went to the hospital. You know, it was like constantly. It was a terrible life. And I was healed at 18. And that healing was the foundation of many others and being able to see God in operation in my life and in the life of others. 
I know for sure I've seen miracle upon miracle over the years. With Dr. Vaughn and I, we saw a lot of them, financial, <laughs> uh, healing, just about everything that you can think of we've seen happen. The reason that is important is I wasn't sitting there trying to figure it out. Every time it was something beyond what I could do. There was no way. So each one of us in here has a call on your life. I received mine when I was 12, and I used to see fish with people's faces. It was terrible. I didn't know what was going on until I was told, you know, you're going to have to throw the line. There is a cost to the life that God has given us. And there is a cost to this rest that he wants us to enter into. It is a promise that has been paid for by our Savior's blood. And so we don't want to be like the children of Israel and not enter in. We want to use our faith. And you know, when you've been in on a path a long time sometimes, you you get to see a lot of miracles, but then there are some things you hide in your heart that God has spoken to you deeply and you're waiting to see it. This is our time. I believe the reason God had me to change the message <laughs> from the one that just whew, has really, be, I have seen so much as a result of that message about the drought being over, you know, but what happens after the drought ends? You know, that's what he was saying. What happens after the drought ends and the rain of the Holy Spirit comes? What happens? We have to step forward. So you are coming up upon a milestone. And each one of you have a particular role in this 40th anniversary. I believe with all my heart that God is completing the things that he started. And we want to enter in to this promise, right? We are believing. We are waiting to see in a hopeful stance and in sacred repose. We're going to rest. We're going to plant our feet firmly upon the word of God, and we're going to see it come to pass. We're going to enter in to this rest. We're going to cease from our labor. God has something that he is providing to us individually and corporately as this ministry. We are going to see it in 2023, but it starts now. I had asked, and I know Apostle, uh, we have known each other <laughs> for a very long time. There is something, though, that we are to provide to you to lift up your arms. You know how when, um, when it was time, they had to lift up Moses' arms? And as long as they kept your arms up, they were able to fight, right? They were able to prevail, so we today are going to lift up your arms in the spirit so that we can enter into this promised land that he has provided for living word, healing, and restoration. There is something that starts today. There's this program called Giving Tuesday. I know you probably heard of it, right? where once a year people get together in November <laughs> and they begin to plant seeds to ministries and churches and even nonprofit organizations that do particular work. We know the work that goes on here, right? We know how our, each one of us sitting in here has been touched by this ministry. Otherwise, we would not be here. Each one of us have received a deposit into our spirit man. And so we are a, as much a part 
of living words, pillars, and foundation. We are, we are the temple. We are the, the air. We are everything. Each one of us. We provide something unique to this body. There is no one in here that does not have a gift that fits because you're here. So God wants to use that gift. And so he wants us to enter in together. He wants us to focus in on this resting faith, to really believe the things that we have been told and that have been imparted by Apostle and Pastor Herring, to really focus in. We've been giving and giving and giving and giving, and now it's time to reach the goal. So I am believing God and am starting today. The last time I was here, the Lord told me to plant a $1,000 seed offering. This time, the Lord is saying, I want you to kick it off. I want you to kick off this thrust. There are so many people that have been blessed by this ministry over 40 years. And so we're going to make an effort to reach them to share the vision, to enter into a kind of a sacred repose with this faith in mind, right? Is everybody on the same page? It's a little bit different than what I had thought we would be doing, but I believe that it's the Lord because when Apostle said 40 years and our sister was saying when the, the celebration would be in March, I was saying, oh my goodness, Lord, you really know your job. You really know your job. And so it is incumbent upon us to really accept this. As we do it, though, if there is a toil that is in your life right now, I want you to stand up so you can drop it. Is there any weight, any um, friction, anything that might be hindering in your life. Now, I had to do this. I had to do it to receive. And I was telling uh, uh, Pastor Wanda that although I have believed and seen miracles, resources, when we were building Channel 49, we saw a whole lot of resources coming in and miraculous money shifting from place to place. I saw all that. But I did not want to be named a prosperity preacher because you know how that has that. <laughs> but the word is prosperous. So there is something I'm admitting I had to overcome regarding that so that I could receive what God has. Now, I could receive it for other people, but I couldn't get it for myself, right? Anybody else in that boat? Got any toil, anything you want to lay down, stand on your feet, we're going <laughs> we're gonna to drop it so that we can start walking. We're going to enter in. We're going to actually take some steps today. We're going to actually walk into, we're going to enter into this promised land. We're going to do it not just by accepting it, but we're going to walk into it so that we can be comfortable, okay? So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just ask for your anointing, for your power to release in the name of Jesus. Release in the name of Jesus. Release in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Anything that might weight us down. Release in the name of Jesus and receive from your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. God give us confidence to take steps entering in to the promised land by faith, by faith, by faith in Jesus' name. 
Rabada de Via Shonaba, Hana Lada de Yasataba. Oh, Hana Badia Shonaba, Hana de Yasanda. Haya, 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 Hona Bokoda de Yasata. I feel the Lord showing. Oh, come by the Yasana Babakiri the Yasanda. Haya da the Yasanda ka. I could feel the uplift, just like we're going up into the the atmosphere in the spirit realm, into the virtual <laughs> reality of God's Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for it, and I also can see. Hallelujah. These golden doors. You know, we see these golden doors that we're to step forward. Hallelujah. 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 To step forward into provision. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To transform lives. There are people that we know when we place our hands upon them, demons will flee. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, families will be transformed as we step through these golden doors. Hallelujah, hallelujah, divine health flowing from our fingertips. Glory to God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.